Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be here. It's exciting to be part of this broader conversation about certification, which I, I think, and I hope you will agree, even after my talk is done, is really interesting. <laughs> OK. Um, I suppose I should say that um, the work that I'm presenting now is kind of a conversation about things I've been doing for a while now. And I'm trying to speak directly to some of the questions that have been raised as, as organizing questions for these presentations on certification. I'll address some of those things um, directly. Uh, my work on certification has most recently been um, uh, sponsored by Fulbright Garcia Robles Fellowship that I had in Mexico, and I was supported by Florida State University at that time. And in 2003, I started to do formal work on forest certification with um, interviews in Durango, Mexico, and Oaxaca, and Mexico City. Um, um, I guess my earliest intersections with certification was when I was a peer reviewer on some of the first certifications that were done in Latin America by Smartwood at a time when I was doing a dissertation work in, in Oaxaca, Mexico. I come to certification in following in the footsteps of community forestry organizations and the supporters of community forestry organizations in Mexico. I ground my work initially in an ethnography of a very conflicted community in Oaxaca on which I wrote my dissertation some years ago now already. So the first issue is what is the Forest Stewardship Council? What does it do? What kinds of institutions does it create? How important is it? Uh, well, the Forest Stewardship Council is a certification organization which consists at its core of a set of principles and criteria. And here are some of those principles and criteria. Um, all 10 of them get to be very small font on a <laughs> PowerPoint presentation. Uh, and the, the criteria are many pages, and there are national interpretations of these standards in many places in the world, and regional in some places in the world. And so those, the FSC, the Forest Stewardship Council, and I should clarify, forest certification is a broader concept. I am speaking about Forest Stewardship Council certification. It's, it's the most influential one, uh, in my opinion, and the one that is most respected by environmental organizations. Anyway, its headquarters are in Bonn, and a small group of people there manage these principles and criteria. They've spun off an organization called Accrediting Services International, which then accredits a set of third-party auditors. There's about 17 in the world, if I'm not mistaken, perhaps more. Um, and those auditors then will, by inv invitation, go to a forest and certify the management of that forest. And they also give chain of custody certifications. So if all works well, what they do is guarantee or qualify the flow of wood from a well-managed forest to the hands of a caring consumer. Uh, it's based on rigorous inspections. It's not just listening to what people say, but looking at the forest management plan, comparing that forest management plan to the state-of-the-art ideas about it, looking at the way that forest management plan is enacted in the field. Um, there is an inspection process which uh, can take many days depending on the, on the size of, of the organization being certified. And it involves social criteria as well. So it's an inspection system that leads to a certification that, that qualifies the biodiversity implications of forest management and the social implications of forest management. Um, it's not like fair trade. The forest manager pays all of the costs. And it, it makes a difference. It's a certification system which has led to better better management plans. In Mexico, foresters rarely monitored what they were doing in the field until certification made this a de facto requirement. Um, it leads to not only the, the designation of conservation areas, but certifiers or auditors, inspectors, will also often require forest managers to produce a, a management plan for those conservation areas. Uh, when I look at my old photographs, some of which I recycle in this talk, and I see the workers and the conditions under which they're working, I think, well, they can never be certified because they're not wearing helmets and um, they don't have light protection for chainsaws and things like that. Um, 
these are illustrations of some of the changes that have been required and have occurred in forest management systems in Mexico. Here is uh, the comisariado, the, the president of the community of La Trinidad de Ixtlan, and the, uh, the inspectors were somewhat concerned about the intensity of logging that they do in the small um, patches that they do. And they asked for um, monitoring and testing of erosion rates. And this is something that is happening because of certifications. This is the first culvert ever used in the community of Santiago Papasquiaro in Durango, which is a fairly large place. And it's actually in the headwaters of important dams. But the communities over years of forestry, much of which was not under their control, had become accustomed to just sending the bulldozer through. And the certifier said, no, you need to do some investments in erosion control, reduce the impact of logging. And that is one of the things that they required. Um, the inspectors in this particular community also saw the environmental impact of large mounds of sawdust from the, from the sawmill next to a water course and in a kind of a step, in a kind of informal stepwise certification in the early 2000s asked them to reduce that, to produce a plan to start reducing that volume of sawdust, which in fact they are. Okay, what are the institutions that are created by the certification system? Well, they are many, and one of them is the FSC itself, which consists of a body with a number, with members from economic, environmental, and social chambers divided into a north and south subchamber in each case. It's inclusive, it's multi stakeholder. So it brings to the table loggers, forest managers, environmentalists. Um, people who are spokesmen or spokespeople for indigenous peoples and organizations. How does the FSC compare to other certification systems? Well, to some sense, it seems to me that it's a kind of a second generation system. If we look at organic or fair trade, they spent a long time evolving on the ground as grassroots organizations. Um, now, in my conversations with Connie, uh, the, it seems that forest certification also had that level of growth, but it kind of sprang to world consciousness after the Rio summit in, in the early 90s as a formal multi-stakeholder organization. So to some extent, it was born mature, although it's still going through its growth processes and its um, mainstreaming processes. And it's a model. It's a model because it's recognized by by the institutions that regulate world trade. And so there are reflections of it, quite direct ones, in the Marine Stewardship Council um, certification system for fisheries, mm -hmm. and less direct, but reflections of it as well in the kind of round tables, the soy round table and the, the palm oil um, uh, uh, multi-stakeholder organization. A small group of people in Bonn are managers or, or part of a much larger network that includes national organizations like FSC, Can FSC Canada and FSC USA, um, regional organizations, national initiatives in 42 countries, 17 certification bodies, many national standards. Uh, this is one of the certification organizations or sort of uh, CB, certification board, Smartwood, based in Vermont. It's the most um, active certifying body in Latin America and the only one active in Mexico at the time at the moment and it's done a lot this network has certified 135 million hectares of forests perhaps 14 percent of the managed forest area of the globe uh, and it's done this with certificates in 81 countries uh, 1024 forests have been certified by this by this system uh, and this is something that's been around for now 15 years only, it's still young. It's growing substantially and rapidly. Ah, uh, yes. Um, here you see the chain of custody certificates which have now reached almost 20,000. Um, they encompass forest uh, associated companies that process many billions of dollars worth of goods. When I first started doing my research in Mexico in 2003, people would talk about FSC certification as a baby. It's just barely in diapers, and we need to make this work for a while. I think now it may have advanced to toddler status. 
Okay, second point. Oh, good, my time is good. That'd be time. Um, the title of my talk is a little bit odd. It sounds somewhat like a bad commercial for cars. Um, FSC is driven to drive markets. Uh, and many of the questions that organize the certification system, this, these lectures on certification, have a kind of a consumer orientation to them. And I have not found that consumer orientation to be very useful in my work. Um, and so that's what I'm trying to say with this Roman numeral two. Uh, we can think of certification, uh, and this is really more of a, a kind of a 2003, 2004 picture of the growth of certification, but I believe it is still relevant. If this is the commodity chain of certification, where forests produce wood, which is processed and transformed and sold to consumers, much of the work in promoting forest stewardship council certification has not been at this level, especially not in the United States. I think perhaps the Netherlands and Switzerland is different, but the United States, oh, there was a little bit of a consumer advertising campaign with Piers Bronin asking people to be action heroes. I think this was on like one line in New York City subway. Um, and you were an action hero by consuming certified wood products. Um, <laughs> Well, hey, it got people to look at a sign and think about what FSC might mean. Um, but a lot of, of stuff in contrast has been more like this. And I love this ad. <laughs> I wish I had thought of it. I mean, Victoria's Secret, I presume, is the same here as it is there. Um, it sells women's underwear, and it sends catalogs to many addresses. Uh, somehow I got off of their address list. I don't know when or why. Um, but they figured out that I'm not very much of a buyer of women's underwear. But anyway, it's a catalog that comes to your house. And this is an ad campaign uh, saying, Victoria's dirty secret, you're sending us all of these catalogs, and where does that paper come from? You cannot attest to its source. And here you have a campaign from the Rainforest Action Network that says, thank you, Home Depot, for having responded to our direct action campaign and adopted for Stewardship Council certification as part of your, your business practices. So this leads me to a slogan which uh, I hope you've heard it first here. It's either sh it's shame or acclaim, Pl plomo or plata, bullets or silver, um, as the Mexican drug and Colombian drug dealers say. You either uh, accept certification or we will blacken your brand name. Um, and they've done this successfully in a commodity network or a commodity chain for wood products, which is really dominated by large retailers. IKEA, Home Depot, B&Q, um, numbers of house builders in the United States that are, that are sm small numbers. So this is a chain in which these retailers are very, very powerful. And drawing on uh, Giraffian kinds of thought, these are retailer-driven markets. They're markets where the retailer tells their producers what to do. And so it's been effective. This arrow traces the flow of wood to a consumer. But if you could reverse that in your head, this, this would be the flow of consumer demand to the forest. The, the forest manager never really hears from the consumer. They hear from the global retailer. Does the global retailer get significant demands from its consumers for certification? I, I don't think so, but I speculate that the answer is no. But they are afraid of this kind of thing. And activists have been very successful going into clear cuts in Canada and writing Home Depot with logging slash and taking pictures of it from a, compute, from a, a helicopter. Uh, so what seems to be driving, I think, much of the growth of certification is this. It's environmentalists demanding it and it's retailers adopting it. But once they adopt it, they find it to be very convenient because they can outsource the, the difficult and expensive and messy work of supply chain management to a third party. Who, it's a third party and incidentally, their suppliers have to cover those costs of certification, not them. But if we think of 
a network of production. And we think of environmental organizations as being part of that network because they're demanding things from other actors within that network. It leads us to think or to ask, what is in this for other, other actors? And one answer to that question, because I think there are many answers, I'm going to try to develop by briefly reviewing some of the work that I've done in Mexico. Um, and since I'm not much of a mystery writer, this is what I'm going to say in this section. Okay, first of all, Mexico is a mega biodiversity country. Um, it has as much forest area as countries that we think of as heavily forested, like Colombia or, or, or India. I'm sorry, I did that too fast. Okay. Much of the, most of the forests in Mexico are owned collectively as collective private properties in the hands of villages, um, either ejidos or comunidades agrarias or comunidades indígenas. Most of Mexican territory is that way, and most of the forests, I guess it's 50% of the Mexican territory is, is social property on more than 50% of the forests, although data is really bad. Um, some of my colleagues have laboriously gone through logging permits to count the number of communities in ejidos that had a logging permit during a five-year span, and it came to about 2,300. Some of those 2,300, a small number, but a significant number, especially the bigger ones, have been able to do amazing things. Um, they have they were able to gain control of their forests from parastatal and foreign concessionaires over a 25-year history. Uh, and some of them have been uh, able to capitalize, and so they run their own logging businesses. And I'll show you the cream of this story in, uh, a little bit later in the presentation, uh, a group that sells furniture. So community forestry is something which is a simultaneously a rural development strategy and also a conservation strategy. Because my Mexican colleagues uh, who promote conservation and development will have recognized that managed forests in the community hands have a much better rate of um, forest conservation than protected areas in government hands. Even though they're logging, the forest cover is, remains intact. The forest area does not decrease. But in parks, it tends to decrease because of invasions and, and lack of land control. So community forestry is a conservation strategy, and it's a rural development strategy. It delivers employment, investment. Communities take their proceeds from forestry, and they put it into collective um, goods frequently. They throw some great parties with that money in honor of their saint and in honor of their town. But they also do things like, uh, um, even a very conflicted community that I did my dissertation research on, their water supply comes through a process that they built with, with proceeds from, from community forestry. Uh, the image in the background here is pl tree planting in an old potato field. A lot of communities have used the social capital they developed from logging to get into other kinds of collective productive enterprises like ecotourism. And it, my colleagues have observed that areas of rural stability in Mexico very often correspond with areas of community forestry. Um, this is an image from the great uh, Mexican cartoonist called El Fiscon. And it was, it's called Agrarian Opening. It's from the early 90s, so it's about free trade. And you see the lo small local farmer about to be swept away by the forces of global enterprise. This is the kind of image that Mexican promoters of sustainable development and community forestry had in their head in the early 90s. How would this incipient sector of community forestry survive insertion into global economies with cheap wood from Chile, with cheap wood from Canada, with cheap wood from the United States, and with really cheap manufactured wood products from China. And they looked around them and they saw organic coffee and fair trade coffee creating spaces for 
uh, uh, for, for coffee cooperatives, many cases indigenous people, the same kinds of social actors who are also involved in community forestry. And they thought, well, let's see if community forest, I'm sorry, if forest certification will operate as a niche that can protect this important sector from the forces of globalization. And they're dealing with logging. They're dealing with a use of the environment which is maligned. When environmentalists see logging trucks coming down from the forest, they imagine clear cuts and they imagine forest devastation. But Forest Stewardship Council forest certification then became part of a broader discourse to legitimate community forestry. Because the story I just told you with those pre previous two slides is pretty much accepted in Mexico now, not universally. But it certainly wasn't in 1992 or 4 or 5 or 6 or 2000. Many actors supported this process of forest certification in Mexico during the years 99 to 2005, more or less, including DFID, um, many multilateral donors as well. And, and interesting actors like, the, like the, the state governor of Durango, he promoted forest certification um, and his spokespeople told me in 2003 that uh, uh, he knows he will not be in office for, forever and he wants to invest in institutional changes that will live past his time in office. And doing forced governance with a third party international organization seemed to be a way for him to accomplish that. It seemed to me, and it seemed to many of the people involved with forestry that I spoke to in 2003, that this really wasn't working very well for them. Because although they were the, the offer of certified wood was going up, the demand for certified wood wasn't. And the kinds of criteria that went with that demand were very difficult for community producers to, to meet. And I think that is because of the, the structure of the market. Um, in 2003, people were talking about Home Depot and suppliers of Home Depot, and they were talking about IKEA. And some of my colleagues in the World Wildlife Fund Mexico talked about bringing or told me that they brought buyers from IKEA to, to Oaxaca. And they said, oh, this is nice quality wood. Oh, it's certified. Oh, that's great. How much does it cost? And that's where the conversation ended because the Mexicans were not able to produce wood cheaply enough for these, for, the, for these global buyers. In northern Mexico, in Durango, which is northern Mexico, the story was a little bit different. They, um, they were, some companies were able to supply Home Depot because the quality of their wood, especially the, the, the older growth wood, had a grain that was great for molding. And so they were supplying a supplier to Home Depot for molding. But although they might have had a little bit better access to markets, there was not a price premium for this wood, at least not a high one. And yet the communities that were engaged in certification, well, yes, they had many of their costs subsidized by state programs from that slide earlier. But still, they were required to pay for annual audits. They were required to pay for the inspection, but many, many cases got a grant for that. And if changes were required, perhaps they weren't able to produce as much wood, that cost they, they, they had to bear. Uh, if they had to produce a management plan or do monitoring, those kinds of costs they had to bear. Okay. So round two is what we are in now, I think. And this is a case in which uh, organizations, especially trees, uh, which is a offshoot of the Rainforest Alliance and has USAID funding and, and many other grants, in, including I think some from, from some of the big timber suppliers, have gone to rural Mexico and worked preferentially with certified communities in order to improve the efficiency of what they were doing and try to improve the value of what they were doing. It's kind of a classic conservationist approach. Let's do more with less. Let's increase the value of your certified wood, even if we can't make the market pay you more for it up front with a big percentage Let's, let's help you in other ways. So this small sawmill of a community called Capulalpan de Mendez in the Sierra Norte of Oaxaca uh, got some extension assistance from trees, increased the sawmill coefficient, so the volume of wood that comes into their sawmill 
corresponds with a higher volume of boards that come out than before, and it increases the value of what they, of, of what they mill in different ways as well. Oh, doing well. Okay. Um, TIP Furniture is an organization composed of the indigenous community of Textitlan, of Ixtlan, and of Pueblos Mancomunados, hence the acronym TIP, T-I-P. Um, all of these communities are fairly large by Oaxacan standards. Uh, I think Pueblos Mancomunados with 15,000 inhabitants is probably the largest. It's a commonwealth of, co of communities and they trace their commonwealth back 450 years in documents. It's very interesting. Um, the other places are also large, both in terms of the number of, of um, uh, inhabitants and rights holders within this community, but even more so in terms of the forest. They have large forest areas, and those forest areas are producing good volumes of, of high quality pine. Well, here's an abstraction of how they are organized. Textitlan has its own forest, a collectively owned forest. They have their own forest management services. They have their own logging services. They have their own sawmill. Um, recently, they have their own wood kiln to dry their wood to, to produce boards with, a, with, with um, an even humidity that won't warp. They recently have acquired a furniture factory. And they have allied in a consortium with Ixlan and with Pueblos Mancomunados, and they now own their own retail outlet stores and their own brand name. I am not aware of any other example in the world where indigenous communities have formed a consortium and, and are so vertically integrated that they own the ecosystem that they're managing and also a brand name and a retail outlet. Uh, have you heard of such a thing? I will continue to say it's a unique in the world then, at the moment, hopefully to be repeated, but at the moment, unique in the world. Um, the consortium shares this, and it's frequent to see the, the plant manager from Ixtlan traveling to Textitlan to walk through their factory and say, okay, the problem is this. You're getting warping because you're doing this. You'll have higher efficiency if you do this. Um, they talk about sharing logging, sharing um, uh, equipment and, and, and even design elements. So it's, there's a lot of back and forth sharing. However, they do have their own individual sales to a government preferred purchasing pro program, and they all have their own clients. And for all three of these communities, they get much more money from selling boards than from selling furniture. And it takes place in Mexico, in southern Mexico. Previously, I referred to Durango, which is up, up here. <coughs> okay. Well, that's interesting. A moment ago, this didn't work. Now it works. Um, I thought I was going to have to uh, shift to a different thing. All right, this is a video um, that, that I made in 2007 and edited, except for these first couple of shots. I was so sick, I couldn't go with the group on this particular day. Um, uh, and you're seeing the forest of Ixlan de Juarez, and these people taking notes are ejidatarios and comuneros from the state of Michoacan, who are on a kind of a horizontal community to community learning program that I was able to participate in on this day. Ixlan de Juarez is one of these communities of tip. They have their own logging business, um, their own, they hire their own foresters, they manage their own forest management plan, they are certified by the FSC. Uh, they have recently capitalized their sawmill um, this is one of the best sawmills in, in Mexico right now, I think. Uh, all Spanish equipment. Um, when they modernized this sawmill, they created a number of unemployed people, and they, cr they built another factory to make pallets to employ them. Uh, they preferentially employ their own community members, but they also employ people from, from the surrounding area. <coughs> sawmill efficiency in this sawmill is reasonably high. This is the only automatic or um, laser-guided sawmill in, in Oaxaca, I believe, unless Textitlan has one now, too, because once your neighbor has one, you want one, too, <laughs> even if you are a community business.
Now, this issue of board selection that you see here is very important. Uh, the wood that comes out of a sawmill is of different qualities. The boards are of different qualities. One important issue is how efficiently you cut up the log. And the second important issue is how carefully you, you um, sort the, the wood. Um, in this case, this wood is uh, sorted into different grades, and they continue to sell their highest grade wood on the market um, to furniture producers in central Mexico and builders and things like that. Um, the chemical that's used as a fungicide in that bath, most places in Mexico is one of these dirty dozen carcinogenic chemicals. So forest certification has led to the elimination of that chemical in every place that has been certified with a sawmill. Uh, now one thing that these furniture um, um, factories do is use finger jointing for the first time in, in Mex in, uh, uh, amongst indigenous communities anyway. And if you finger joint, you cut out the knot and then you glue the board back together and you're basically taking the lowest quality board in your sawmill and producing something that's very much like the highest quality board in your sawmill. So it's another example of doing more with less. It's a production aspect that is environmentally beneficial because it increases the, the output from, um, from your forest, the economic output from your forest. That guy who just saw me filming him and walked away embarrassed is the um, business, the plant manager for Nuevo San Juan Parangari Cutiro, say that five times, in, uh, in Michoacan, Mexico, which is another one of the large, um, fascinating, integrated uh, community businesses in Mexico. And we have now stepped into the retail outlet store of tip furniture in a upper middle class neighborhood of the city of Oaxaca. I think that's where it ends. So if I hit, yes. Okay, so to repeat, what we saw were images of production from a set of communities in which forests are well managed. Um, they're supplying furniture to the state government in a preferred purchase program. They have their own retail outlet store and their own brand name. And it's a kind of a factory outlet store. So as the business managers explained to me, it's one way of trying to compete on price with other producers. So when they open up an outlet store in Puebla, which they probably have done by now, they don't have to make a profit at the store level. They just have to cover costs at the store level. <laughs> and if they cover costs at the store level and sell things with a fat profit to the factory, they are ahead of the game. And so they can sell things more inexpensively than they would be able to otherwise. Certification has played a role in this process. Um, when I asked them in my interviews in 2008, uh, what, sort of, what role does certification play? Their answer would be, uh, we are making certification play a role. They see themselves as actors who are using their certification, doing a lot of other things to make certification worthwhile for them. However, I think they over stated a little bit because they will also tell me in my interviews that all of the members of our consortium have certified forests. This is important. All of us have the same level of forest management and we know it without going to each other's forests to look. Um, and we're all indigenous communities with a similar kind of historic background. They're all, they're all um, historically Zapotec communities, although not much Zapotec is spoken in any of them except Textitlan anymore. They don't border each other, they're in different places. Uh, they have the same kind of scale of production so they're not worried about flooding each other out with what they're doing or um, nobody's saying, I'm not gonna join with these big powerful uh, community. And they also use certification to legitimate what they're doing with the government. They were actors, inducers in getting the, the state government to, to uh, commit to purchasing wood furniture. And by doing so, they displaced the purchase of plastic furniture built in factories in central Mexico. So the state government is now using federal school funds to promote its own forest sector. And one of the arguments that they were able to make when they did this was to say that our forests are certified. So state government, when you buy our wood furniture chairs, you don't have to worry about some environmentalist organization saying, why are you promoting the destruction of Oaxaca's forests? 
You are not. Our forests are certified and you are supporting a project of social and environmental restoration and well-being. So as I said, when I ask the business managers of these organizations what role certification plays, they say, we are making certification play a role. So part of their story is that they are putting certification in a larger package that they sell to the society in which they are part. Um, but certification is part of what they're doing. They're promoting a school furniture market. Um, they're making explicit steps to improve the physical quality of, the, of what they produce. Uh, vertical integration is part of their story, Inter inter-community cooperation, and price reduction through the outlet factory store. Certification is part of a signifying thing that underscores what they're doing. These are some of the people, or some of the organizations in the network of organizations that give money, that provide technical support and so on that have mentioned certification to me in, in, their, in justifying what they're doing. Um, even the Federal Small Business Office that's involved in different ways with this story says, oh, and it's certified, so it's, it's good for the environment. We're not destroying forests. Trees has been very important, and um, trees, the, a technical assistance NGO, which is rela related to the Rainforest Alliance. Okay. Uh, so, what is the role of this certification story in promoting consumer understanding? Uh, well, first of all, we're talking about a market which is local, right? We're not exporting to IKEA. Um, we're producing for the Oaxaca middle class. Uh, we're producing for uh, a government buyer of, um, by manufacturing school furniture. But in their retail outlet stores, they do have things, they have displays like this one, which has uh, posters like this one with the FSC logo on it and the Panda certification. Certification, FSC certification, brings environmental, economic, and social benefits to the wood industry, which seems strangely phrased to me, but that's what it says. It brings social and environmental and economic benefits to the wood industry. And it's got, you know, stock images of this. And there's, there's nobody in those communities with parrots like this boy. Um, this picture is from 2007. This is from 2009. It seems to me that they're getting better about promoting themselves. This is what you see when you walk into the, their, their showcase store right now. And those are actual pictures of Sapotec boys from the communities planting pine trees, smiling. Um, they don't say FSC though, do they, Connie? <laughs> uh, if you go farther into the store, the FSC symbol does come up, but it seems to me that they are engaged in a process of creating trust in which the international label is part of the story that they have of creating trust. Okay, so concluding thoughts. If I had had time, I would have said the following things. Um, a market is a kind of a production of nature in that Marxist concept. Uh, it ties together consumers and producers and intermediaries in a shared project of environmental and social transformation. And certification is leveraging things within that market. It alters those markets. I'm not sure that it transforms them, but maybe. But understanding those kinds of alterations requires us to think about the political economy of a market and the social ecology of a market um, in a way that has to get past the idea of consumer sovereignty that you know, uses that perhaps a little bit. But I can understand what's happening in Mexico 
by tracing consumer demands through these different organizations to the community level. Um, I'm seeing environmental activists using certification and shame and acclaim campaigns. I'm seeing retailers using it to protect their brands. I'm seeing sustainable development promoters ranging from, it's a kind of strange category I just made up, uh, ranging from the governor of the state of Durango to people in the World Wildlife Fund Mexico office using certification and promoting certification for what they're doing. And I've seen Mexican community forest organizations, the cream of the crop, using forest certification as part of their larger story of saying, hey, what we are doing is something that is socially important and environmentally sound. And don't just believe me because I'm saying it. Here's this international third party accreditation which is backing up what I'm saying. And it's giving a foundation to my story. Certification came out of environmental timber boycott movements in the early 90s when people were saying, you know what, boycotting tropical timber is probably the worst thing that we could do for deforestation. And yet there's a lot of people that want to do it. Let's see if we can identify good forest management. So it's related to a broader conversation about tropical forest deforestation. And if I go back to that conversation now, I'd have to say that FSC is doing, FSC certification is doing important work for tropical forest management, but it's not quite enough. Uh, before I press the next click, let me say this is a photo. This is one of those photos I've been recycling since my dissertation work. Um, I'm, I'm sure none of you do that <laughs> when you give PowerPoint presentations. This is Laur Laurentino in a community which is now certified. And when I looked at this photo after being involved in certification, I looked at it in a different way. My first story about it was, doesn't this look horrible, what this man is doing to the forest? But it's actually a positive thing. Because he is in, he's a member of a community forestry who is going out and cutting up the logging slash so that it's closer to the ground, so that it gets, in, it's, gets incorporated into the soil more quickly, and so that, so that it is less of a fire hazard. So it's a picture that I've used in the past to talk about how good forest management is ugly, but that doesn't make it bad. And community logging is OK if it's done adequately. So this is something which is actually positive, because other forms of forestry in Mexico at this time would have just left the slash in the forest to decay at its own rate and to pose a fire threat for a longer period of time. But now I look at this photo and I say, Laurentino, where is your eye protection? <laughs> where is your helmet? And where, where are the chaps that if you slip on that logging slash and hit your leg with that sawmill, with that chainsaw, you don't lose your leg? Where are those things? For Stewardship Council certification, would notice that as an error and ask the community to correct it. This community is now involved in certification, even though it's much smaller scale than the other ones that I showed you. OK, but what did I tell you a moment ago? There's 15,800 communities in Mexico that have forests, probably. 2,000 of them have been involved in logging. They have various levels of integration. And I've told you a happy story about three of them, which are struggling to make certification work for them. Certification fails to, meet, to reach most communities. It fails to reach most forests, um, and it fails to reach most managed forests. So there's a lot more to be done after certification reaches the best communities. OK. I promised something about the contradictions of FSC as a sustainable development strategy. And here's where I try to deliver one slide. I have one slide left after this one, and it's just a picture. So Forest Stewardship Council certification is really important. It's really effective at a number of things. But are the questions that it makes people ask about production systems sufficient for solving 
a global environmental problem, which is a problem about consumption as well as production. It's not just a problem about whether forests are well managed. It's a problem about how much paper people are using, how much wood people are using, how much forests are needed to meet those needs, and whether those needs are being met in an equitable manner. If we think about sustainable development, we have to think about equity in consumption levels. So FSC is arguably, hopefully it's changing. Every time I make an argument, I see that the FSC community is involved in an argument about what I'm saying. And they're usually ahead of me. <laughs> um, but it seems to me that FSC is more about big producers than, than smaller community producers, although there are strategies to change that. It's more about big retailers like Home Depot in the US or B&Q in the UK, and not very much about this yet, but I hope that's changing. Um, it's more about these other things than about this. All right, is that glass half full or half empty? Now, according to African-American folk wisdom, well, that depends, honey. Are you pouring or are you drinking? <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> right. OK, the, the volume is 50%. But what's important is what part of a process it is in. Now, if, if third-party certification systems, like the Forest Stewardship Council, never get past where we are now, it's problematic. I can, Im I can imagine a sustainable future in which there are large organizations selling large volumes of goods over large distances as a part of a global economy. Um, and I can imagine a sustainable future in which that happens. What I can't imagine is a sustainable future in which that happens without more questioning about those processes and those consumption levels than we have right now. So if FSC is something which allows rich, complacent consumers in comfortable parts of the world to feel better about their big new teak deck, it's better than if they feel nice about a big teak deck without wondering about what kind of forest the teak came from or plantation. But it's not enough if those patterns of consumption are never questioned. And that's what third-party certification has not yet been able to do. If it is part of a conversation which leads to that, it is very important. If it is not, I fear it will not be important. And we will use our world up. Thank you. <laughs>